Hey folks, Patrick Francy here, host and creator of The Everyday Millionaire, inviting you to listen in with my guest today, E.B. Tucker. Now, like you, I'm always looking to grow my wealth and to manage my risks. And by having guests like E.B. on the show, we get some insights from best-selling authors like E.B., as well as his insights and what he's doing. So before we get started, just a polite ask to make sure you like, to comment, to subscribe to this channel. Look forward to having this conversation with EB. He is the author of his book, Why Gold, Why Now? The War Against Your Wealth and How to Win It, as well as he provides, like his book, many very rich insights and strategic advice on what's happening in the world today, both economically and even societal. So listen in, enjoy this conversation. E.B. Tucker, welcome to the Everyday Millionaire podcast. So good to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for asking me. Now, E.B., I've been following you for, I think, about four years. So it was pre the, you know, the world lockdown shit that went on and, you know, all the things that happened. But you really got me on this path of understanding gold and all sorts of things. And I want to talk about that. But you know, as much as I do the intros into it, I always like to ask my guests when somebody walks up to you, EB, given all you do, when somebody says, EB, what do you do? What's what's your answer to that question these days? You have a good time. Have a good I mean, time. Yeah, okay. you're, 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 it's not, this isn't, this, this isn't going to go on forever. That's the, the, the unfortunate news that nobody told me when I was younger is that this doesn't, this doesn't go on forever. And, um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine today that 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 has a bunch of little kids, and um, and uh, I was telling him, I was like, "Look, you know, d don't put off anything. Like you're, you know, they're taking the, their little kids on a trip, and I said, do you know if they want to do something, do it. If they, if you see something the family wants to do, do it. Live now, live now. You know, don't. A lot of times when you're trying to work hard and build, you're always delaying." things right you're saying well you know I'm, I'm a frugal person so i'll you know it doesn't mean like spend yourself you know into oblivion it just means um the best thing you can do for your long-term success is to live a balanced life and mm -hmm. part of that is to make sure that you are enjoying experiences with people that you in, that you enjoy being around mm -hmm. now and um that was hard for me, right? I didn't, I was, I was like, I didn't, I don't want to, everybody in the U.S. always says they came from a difficult, like you, every single person that you talk to that's successful in the U.S. are like, I was burnt, I was born uh, dirt poor, you know? And it's like, how is it that all you guys were burnt, born poor and ended up, you know, I don't, I don't even believe it to be honest with you. But the thing <laughs> is, um, I wasn't born poor, but I also wasn't born like uh, super rich either. You know, it was, it was kind of, you know, I knew I was going to go to college, right? Like I, you know, I knew, you know, my dad had a little furniture store. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, I was like, uh, you know, going without heat or something, but, mm -hmm. but I definitely, I, I didn't have like, it, it, you know, excessively nice things. Like as a kid, like I, I knew there were, I, I knew I wanted independence. Right. And so the problem going back to your question is that, is that I was so focused on achieving that I a lot of times did not enjoy the process because I was so fixated on the goal mm. and it didn't mean material. It wasn't like a material thing. It was like I was determined to not be confined and, and put into a cube or a box and all these things. And I was willing, I was willing to go without everything, even personal relationships, even, um, uh, enjoying small pleasures. I was willing to do without anything to get my goal. And if you read goal setting books, you know, they talk about this, but, but I would say now in my life, I realize you can have both. You can have both of those things. You can, you can enjoy your, your, every single moment of your journey now. And, and when you do that, I'm telling you, magical stuff happens. You notice more opportunities when you're living a balanced life than when you're on tunnel vision. So that's an interesting point of entry into a conversation. So when you look at your best-selling author of your book, Why Gold, Why Now, which was the war against your wealth and how to win it. I mean, that is a really, I found that book really quite fascinating. Now I've been investing in gold. 
I'm not gonna. I've been buying gold. <laughs> I've been exchanging fiat currency for gold. Just to be clear on that, when I look at gold from an investment point of view, it's it's I, I, I'm careful, a little more careful these days about the language that I'm using. But aside from that, I mean, you were in financial markets. You you're a, a, an entrepreneur. You're a busy guy. So given all of that, was there a fork in the road that something happened, an incident, or what was the realization that's going? Hold on, I got to get my head out of my ass and kind of get focused on life in general, having fun. Not yes. So driven. Focused. Yes. I mean, they're, they're it, so, so uh, I'm not quite as young as I look. I, I was, I was trapped in sales jobs initially uh, when I was younger. It's because I'm a decent communicator and people thought this guy would really be able to sell a lot of our widgets. And so I kept getting hired for these sales jobs. And one of the guys um, that, that I worked for uh, was a really smart guy. I'm going to actually, I'm still in touch with him. This is going back 20 years. I was, I'm going to see him uh, in a few weeks. And um, he fired me. And he, and he fired me because he said, if you don't work in finance, you're going you're gonna to miss one of the great opportunities of, of life. Oh, and yeah. And so he, he gave me like, I mean, I was, I was, I worked for this um, wholesale furniture company, like, like they, there was a manufacturing company and I was, there was 400 salesmen and I was like number three or something. And, um, and so I was making money, but he, he was like, you don't understand. Like, like he, this guy had a bunch of money. He had his own company that he sold and he was kind of like trapped to keep working there, but he had like, made a pile of money and he kind of took me on as like a, it was a bit of like a fatherly figure. And he, he was like, you know, you're sitting down and telling me about stuff that you think, and I'm reading about this from funds that I'm invested in, like mm -hmm. private partnerships and stuff. And like, you, you, this is all you think about and you're making six figures. And this, you know, like in the early two thousands, that, that was like kind of a lot of money. I mean, it felt like a lot of money. Um, and he was like, but, but you're already at the top of this game. And if you don't use this fire that you have in this other way, you know, you're going to regret. Now that was a double-edged sword because I had no idea. I, I was applying for jobs, trying to go to New York, trying to do all these things, couldn't make anything happen. And, um, I would say maybe 18 months later, I was fired from a job, um, that I, I wasn't very good at and and that was when i couldn't find another i couldn't find anything and i just like by default was starting to write and i was writing on like a, a blog there was this thing called blog spot back then and i was writing on this blog spot you know and and um and so that that was like when everything started and, and that was a game changer because uh, when you're right you have to really really be serious about your ideas I mean, you can't you can't just like say these like flippant things you have to really be be serious and 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 and, and it's a it's publicly it's kind of like if you're a noisy kid in school the way to deal with that kid is to give them a, a job yeah and so um and so that's what happened and and then i just started like it was this weird time where i was technically i was unemployed okay so i collected unemployment so you know i was unemployed um i, I had a i had a roommate like i had a house but i had a little like three bed two bath like little ranch tiny house and yep. and i had a roommate uh that you know because i needed help like paying for it and um and i and i just i just stripped everything like i i had had a car and then I, I got like this, um, my friend had a, has a junkyard and he got me this like uh, F-150 from a road crew, like from a, a paving sure. crew. It was used, it was, it was $1,800 yeah. and it had a bench seat. I mean, it turned out to be one of the best times of my life because I would go on dates in the F-150 and there were two kinds of dates. One kind of date said, is this a joke, right? <laughs> the other date said, wow there's a bench seat which means i could sit next to you you know like <laughs> like you're in like a country totally. western song or something yeah. and um so just looking back on it that was a that was a great time and, and anyway so the but the point is is that things got very serious and uh 
uh, I'd made a lot of choices. I made a lot of life choices that we don't get into that, that like, I just decided, like really decided that this is what I wanted was independence. And, uh, I wanted intellectual independence. I didn't, I didn't have necessarily money goals. I wanted intellectual freedom. And in order to have intellectual freedom, I needed financial freedom, but financial freedom is not what you think. Like the, the F-150 truck was paid for. So, so, you know, now you have a vehicle. Well, and then I had a house, I had this like little house and, and I had uh, this guy, you know, renting the room for me. And so, so yeah, I mean, I had, I was collecting unemployment. I mean, technically speaking, you know, I was like started that journey to financial independence, which was necessary so that I could have intellectual independence. And again, I want to characterize, I mean, it wasn't like I was, you know, like eating spam or something. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was, it was lean, it was yeah. lean, but it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't like the grapes of wrath or something. It was, it was like, it was, it was like I was choosing. Cause see what happened next is, is I was writing this blog and I was, and I'd been trading um, Fannie Mae puts and countrywide puts and all this stuff. And I'd been losing money. And so, and so I was like writing about, I was just kind of like griping about this. I was like, I don't understand. And, you know, like the housing, all this stuff. And then it, then it all started to happen. And, and I didn't make, I didn't really make money in that trade. Like I didn't, a lot of people like famously made money and I didn't really make any money. But what happened was I did a ton of homework and I lost money. I mean, I lost like 20 grand or something. I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a lot of money, but it was like, I kept these puts, I kept buying these puts like yeah. after, one after another and they just kept expiring worthless and and so i had done all this work and then when the mortgage thing started to unwind i was like ready i was really ready because because all that work that i had done didn't make any money but i had this like immense amount of knowledge and so, so this I, is 2000 when you say when the mortgage thing started yeah. happening, you're talking about 2008 gfc exactly exactly yeah, yeah. exactly and i had some like so so um what I did is I was writing at the time. I mean, and I'm talking like a hundred people are reading my stuff and mostly because I'm like anybody that emails me, I'm like putting their name into my blog spot. Yeah, and, yeah, so it's like, I'm really pushing it. And um, uh, I started writing about, about how this was going to be like a once in a, this was going to be like the Haley's comet of, of opportunities to buy rental property. And I'm telling you, man, people were so uh, hostile about this theory. And mm. and part of the reason why is because like I'd never owned any rental property, but I always like wanted rental property. And I was like, oh, this, you know, my granddad had some rental property and he get these checks. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And um, and so I think I think looking back on it, it was because what I was saying is the deal has to work at that time on cash on cash numbers and mm. and nobody thought that way and so and so i i built this little excel model where i just would plug in like ex uh anticipated rent and yep. uh re repairs all this stuff okay. and then and then i would like divide that by x and that would give me my price you know and so i was like writing about this and if everybody was like this this won't work you know and um and I just, I mean, I'm telling, if you're young right now, like this is 16 years ago, I'm telling you, we thought then that real estate might never go up again. <laughs> and so, you know, the modeling was like, if real estate never goes up again, can I, um, can I so make money? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, and so what I did was, was I targeted a scenario where I could make 18 to 20% on my money if real estate never went up again. Right. And um, and I did that. And so I took my whole uh, IRA, you know, uh, I guess in Canada, it's the uh, RRSP or something. But anyway, I took like the whole retirement account yeah. and you can you can liquidate it and yeah. you pay like a 10 percent penalty uh, penalty and yeah. then you pay income tax. Well, my income was zero because yeah. I was collecting unemployment. So I had no income. And so my accounting guy was like, yeah, I mean, you're going to, this is probably the lowest tax you'll, you'll have, you know, it's like, so, um, uh, and then I bought like six houses cash, oh. cash. I mean, like yeah. I was, I, I, I paid about like 
the cheapest one I bought was ten dollars a foot, a square <laughs> foot. Yeah, Good. and so, <laughs> and I guess I guess the, I mean these these were like um, you know it wasn't like they were brand new or anything. I mean they you know they needed sure. some repair and all this stuff, but they all needed air conditioning and you know pl plumbing yeah. repairs. And, you had to put some money into them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a tremendous amount, but I mean, yeah. I had to put money into. It, but 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 to, for, for, if people aren't into the real estate scene, like I, I would think now it probably costs 150 a foot to build like a basic dwelling or something in the U.S. I, I'm, I'm I'm guessing, but it's probably roundabout close. And um, and then I just I I got a guy. I, I was at the Verizon store. I met this guy that had like this van with Ron Paul stickers all over it. <laughs> Remember Ron Paul and yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy was like this, like just this, like you know, patriotic kind of like he told. He, I was like, yeah, you love Ron Paul. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, he's going to save this country anyway. And um, you know, he was like a welder and all, he had all these skills. And so I got this guy to work for me, and then I got this painter guy off Craigslist uh, that was kind of a volatile personality. And and I that was my crew. You know, we picked up other people as we needed them, and we repaired all these places, and then. Then I met this investor that wanted the same thing. I made some money, like a hundred grand doing that. And, you know, anyway, anyway, so like that, that was a, that wouldn't have happened. The reason I'm giving you all that detail is that none of that would have happened if I didn't get fired, right, have the ideas, oh. crystallize the ideas, take the risk. You know, it was like, you know, because we could talk later about more things happened after that, right? Because I really don't like real estate. I mean, I don't, I actually like, fundamentally it's not like i hate real estate but i i don't really like real estate that much you know and so well you I, in a recent interview i don't remember who it was with you know danielle Camboni or somebody anyways along the way i've seen some of your interviews and you you've actually exited your real estate in the past couple of years i sold all that stuff yeah yeah i sold all that stuff now and and and, and, and by the way i i i calculated that because i i had it like in a i had it like in an llc and a company and so I, I calculated the um, total rent received and total uh, spread between cost and so yep. anyway, it was about it was over a thousand percent on that trade. And that sounds like a lot of money. Now, it was tax advantaged as well, because, you know, you, you have some like income tax, you know, you pay very low income tax when you're working through that. But to give you some frame of reference, I also could have made a thousand percent buying Amazon stock and doing absolutely nothing. Now I'm not, not, I'm not comparing apples to apples here, but what I'm saying is that um, I did feel like I sold everything. Okay. So in 2022 in February, I got a call from the guy that was managing the properties for me at the time. And, and I was super annoyed with the whole process and I was annoyed with them and everybody. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I'm going to sell these things. And so I just like impulsively listed all of them with this. I listed one with this lady that I, that I use for all the real estate stuff I do. I have yep. this like aggressive lady. She's like, if I called her at three o'clock in the morning, she'd answer. <laughs> she's like, believe she's <laughs> like, she's always available. And um, um, nobody hustles like her. And so I called her and listed one. And, and then two days later, I, I was like, just list all of them. And so I sold all of them. And it turns out that um, they all sold before the rates not before the rates the rates went up one time or something and they were basically all under contract except one and then the market started getting soft and i blew out i took a slightly low ball offer on the last one and got rid of it i got rid of all of them so um now i don't have any i don't have any but i am looking at some things in that you know i was just on a call today with some guys that are buying uh trailer parks that um I, I, one of the guys I'm like really impressed by. And so I, I might do something like that, but it's totally passive. It's not like, uh, yeah, you're just, you're yeah. being a capital partner and all. I that. just think, I just think that the guy that was c calling me, like I've known him, he used to lease workforce housing, like low income housing. Yeah. And he's just like really on top of things. And I'm like, I, I just think the odds of him being successful are really high. And so like they showed me, you know, a deal that's like, they have a fair promote split and like, you know, anyway, I was like, I think this will probably work. You know, I'm not necessarily like massively bullish on real estate. It's not like I'm like charging into real estate, but I think if you're, you know, you, you know, this when you have to think about all sides of things. And like, sometimes you see a person 
and you're like, this is a guy that like, definitely if he fails, it's going to be like, not because of laziness. So when you, when you look at real estate and what's going on in the markets overall, what's happening in the U.S., you've got some idea of what's going on in Canada. I mean, we spoke very briefly in Vancouver at the uh, investor conference, the resource conference. But when you so you spend a little bit of time, you know, what I'm seeing is a lot of Canadians, they're moving, they're taking their real estate capital or capital that they would normally invest in Canadian real estate. They're going, no, I'm going to the U.S. So when you look at real estate in the U.S., are you are you somewhat optimistic about where it's going? I mean, when we look at what's happening overall with, with central banks, global market, threats of wars, I mean, do you think real estate's a good play overall in the U.S.? Or what's your kind of read on it right now? I mean, I'm not like necessarily bullish on it. Um, I just think that if you can pin down the 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 model and you can say there's some tax advantage. Um, I'm not totally leverage mm. stuck, right? Like, uh, you know, these guys are doing these trailer parks, like 30% leverage or something. And I'm like, ah, it's just really hard to get flushed, you know, when you're, when you've got something like that going on. And um, I think that's the way to look at it is like, you, you can't, the newsletter I wrote today, it, it's, people can read that at ebtucker.com. I mean, it's all about how um, the, the U.S. economy is centrally controlled. You know, so you're so you have like these central planners that that do everything, and so it's it's impossible to like try to forecast uh, unless you start thinking about what they might be thinking. Then you can then you can forecast, right? But or what their motivations are, which is not that hard to do. And and so, but my point is is that. It's it's not a time where there it's not like a it, it's not that Hilly's comet moment for real estate, right? And so I think that when you look at deals, you you got to say to yourself, um, like the thing about the the lower end stuff that makes sense now is that like it's all about laziness versus hard work. I mean, you know, I mean, I I I just really understand that part of the market and and how it's difficult to leverage. I think where you get in trouble now is if you're doing like a class A property at like a, a low cap rate. I think that it's 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 like you're you're really banking on rates coming down. Yeah. So you're banking on being able to refinance later. So I just don't think that's a good bet because um, it's it's like how can you predict what a, a room full of people is going to do um, <laughs> these days. You, I don't, I listen, you can't, I you can't, you can't do it. I mean, I think, I think, so I think you have to change your thinking to accommodate that. Yeah. And then you just have to say like, I might miss out. I mean, I might, you know, I might, I might miss out, but, but property can only go up for a few different reasons. You know, number one, income can go up. So income's got to rise faster than expenses. So yeah. that's one way property can go up. The second way property can go up is, um, Financing costs can come down. Yeah, those are the only two ways that it can go up. Um, and I'll, I mean, this could be a change in the tax code or something, but but basically, those are the two things to look at. And expenses have gone up a lot, and income has gone up a little bit. And so that's not really. Are we forecasting higher? I don't think people can afford that much more. It is. It's rent. an interesting time, isn't it? You know, when we look at what's happening here in Canada with the immigration that's off the charts, which is what's happening in the U.S. I mean, we have a huge supply issue, a significant supply issue that we can't keep up. We don't have the labor to build it fast enough to accommodate the people that are coming into the country. Yeah. And it's really out of control and off the charts, which is somewhat, you know, in certain parts of the U.S. We're, I'm watching a little bit of what's going on in Texas, for example. And, you know, when you look at the number of immigrants coming into the U.S., it really is, you know, shocking of, of the people that are coming out west, if you will, if you use that term. And how are you going to accommodate them? You got to house them. I mean, you guys are putting them in schools. You know, it's like you sleep there for now. Yeah, it's, it's not. I mean, it's like in the 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 U.S. The thing that's just like a real bummer is that the the building kind of the attitude towards constructing is really broken. Um, mm -hmm. I just ordered this book. I'm going to write about this in the newsletter there's like a personal section in the bottom and I, I but i ordered this book um there's this thing in the u.s in the post-world war ii era called the case study houses and a, and a magazine you might already know about this but a magazine called like arts and architecture 
came up with this idea where they would have these case study houses that they would have architects build. And the and it was it was a twofold purpose. Like number one, the architect could flex their their ability to to create aesthetic, you know, and that's what they like to do. And then number two, they were like, then we can we can study that and try to find mass production ways to, you know, incorporate some of these design elements and things. And in when you look at these houses, like it's unbelievable how 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 forward leaning the design was and how cool they were. And and sometimes they were able to use materials like terrazzo and you know to work with concrete in certain ways and to use glass to 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 work with you know lighting and how that changed how something that's all gone. That's gone. You now we build aluminum stud, cardboard wall, uh, <laughs> and and we build it for a certain lifespan and then we tear it down and build it again. <laughs> and and that's and it's fine because it's like it's very mechanical but it it just is a real bummer to do that and then just squeeze five cents out of it and you just like what is the point of all this man? I mean I mean can't we build something that's fun that that you get a higher rent from owning it, you know, you have you enjoy being the owner. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe maybe not. I mean I, I, I I'm I'm starting to think no is the answer. And and uh and so then you you know it's utilitarian is what we have. You know, it's it's and, and utilitarian is not just in the materials, it's in the way we we buy it too, right? It's all yeah. about like Barry Sternlich, who who so I have I have a favorite hotel and um anyway, it's it's not really relevant because you could pick any hotel, but I have one that's my favorite, and Barry Sternlich bought it. And he's going to ruin the place. I mean, I, I've already found that he's going to like do all these changes and whatever. But anyway, but he's like a, a billionaire, you know, real estate investor in the U.S. Um, Star Starwood properties or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and 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 Sternlich, you know, is is actually quite interesting to listen to because he's he's like he'll default on a property. And then like the next day he's on Bloomberg talking about how he's like geared up to buy distressed property, you know, and he's really smart. And so um, he, he said the other day in this interview I watched, he was like, basically I'm in the business of borrowing money. Mm -hmm. That's the business that I'm in. And, and so, and he's, it's, it's super accurate, right? Cause his job is to like borrow money and buy stuff and then control it while it expands in value and then sell it. And it's it really kind of a, of, he's, I mean, that's, you know, Robert Kiyosaki basically says that, in a different way, but he's the same guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just borrowing lots of money from the bank and, you know, they're happy to give it to me. I wanted to depart from the real estate conversation a little bit, Evie. And when we look at, you know, your background in the markets and, and in precious metals and mining and your, your experience and all of that, when we look at what's happening in the world today, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I picked up your book was we're like COVID, you know, it's going to be zombie apocalypse, you know, the world's coming to an end, some version of a meltdown. Uh, I think it was a lot of people expected it to happen a lot sooner than it seems to be happening or might happen or might not happen, whatever the case is. I mean, when we're starting to look at investing and preparing for the future, like, how do you hold it? I mean, real estate is, you know, one of those things that you say, okay, you know, I, I can do the math. I understand the system. I understand the process. I can put my capital to work. I know the region. I know my demographics. So got it. I got real estate handled. But when we expand it and when, you know, I know one of your specialties, of course, is precious metals, hence your book, Why Gold? Why Now? So, but when you look at what's happening economically, you know, how as investors, should we be, I don't know, protecting our, well, not only growing our net worth, but actually even risk mitigating or protecting what we've built, given what's yeah, I going mean, on in the world? In the newsletter, you know, I, I have a, I, I was asked to manage a, um, some assets for a trust. And, um, and so I decided to, with permission of the trust, you know, to, to publish what I'm doing in the newsletter. And it's been really interesting because um, I, I love reading the comments that people leave because people are really lost. I mean, they don't they, they they the Fed has has turned us all into junkies. So we 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 grew up in this capitalist system. We have all these ideas about how you you spend you know less than you earn, save the difference, invest it as capital, but it's all it's all out the window. 
Um, we're all speculators. That's what we are. And so we, we are supposed to own these things that go up in value. And then, and the, and the, the thing people miss is that the fed actually wants us to be successful speculating because, um, one of the big holes in the U S budget right now is the, um, capital gains tax numbers mm-hmm. are, are down, you know, because people, people made a lot of money in 2021 and 2022. And then they paid a lot of, they were shocked that a lot of these people were like valet parking cars and they were like trading options and with Dave Portnoy <laughs> or something. And they're like, I got to pay tax on all this. Sure, yeah, and, yeah. um, anyway, so, so, but, but right now people aren't really realizing that many gains because, um, everything's kind of like sideways. And, uh, and I think it's really important to realize you're in a managed system and the fed wants you to be successful because over the long term, because you, you, they want you to stay working and they want you to invest in stuff and make money and pay tax. All right. So you got to play that game. So, so you got to, I mean, the likelihood of you having a, a tsunami wipeout type thing go on is low. And, um, and further, if that does happen, uh, you don't want to be careful what you wish for, right? Because if the Western system goes down, uh, you're part of that, like it or not, right? Yeah. So you want this you want this thing to chug along in one form or another. And so I, I feel like right now um, is a time that you need to take a balanced approach. You need to look at yourself as a trustee. See, everybody looks at themselves like they walked into a casino and they're going to try to leave with that spinning Mustang that is in there. And they're not going to do that. Um, and a lot of times people get hung up on saying like, well, easy for you to say, cause you have tons of money, but you know what the thing is when you have tons of money, it's, it's nothing like what you would think. It's not anything like what you would think. It's a whole different perspective. And what it does is it sends you back. And you realize that you got to get your you got to get your habits right early, not once you have a hundred million bucks. Okay, you get your habits right, and you start realizing that if you've saved up any amount of money, and you have you you want to maintain that. That's the number one thing you want to do is you want to maintain it. So you want to shape your approach to money management now. You don't want to say I'm going to gamble like some kind of sailor that stepped off, you know, into port and is looking to have a wild night. I don't want to do that. I want want to manage, like, I don't want to lose this amount of money. I mean, I don't, I also don't want to like put it into a a savings account either. It's not like that, but. But how how do you, like, so how do you hold risk then EB? Like, because I mean, obviously you've you've put put risk capital into lots of ventures Sure. You've, uh, you've won some. There's, there's room for that. There's yeah. room for that now still. But but in, in the trustee portfolio, I'm showing people that, um, okay, so I own some gold, you know, and, and gold is not really an investment. Yeah. It's just like a, a, a holding pen for, for hard work. So yeah. so I don't expect that to do a lot. I mean, I think that'll go to like 2150 this year. And I, I think that's like a, people think that's a boring prediction, but that's a trillion dollars in um add, added value to the gold to the value of all the gold in the world it's kind of a lot you know so yeah. uh, you can go to 2050 then i think you got to own some bitcoin i don't think you got to own uh any other cryptocurrency because uh, I, I, I i think bitcoin is is um that's it is Wholesome. super yeah it's interesting it's just yeah. there's it's okay at forty three thousand. I think let's see i have it over over here forty three thousand. Uh, I, I think that's about like a 900 billion or something of Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so I just was saying a minute ago that the gold price going to 2150 is about a trillion. That's more than all the Bitcoin. So yeah. just to give you some, and and then so people say, well, wait a minute, you know, are you are you like a crypto person? No, I mean, I think it's totally annoying to deal with crypto people. So I tried to explain to people. The, let's say the trust has a million dollar portfolio, hypothetically. Maybe I have 50 grand in gold. Maybe I have 30 grand in Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Do you see how I'm thinking? So, yeah. and then I start looking at the other parts like you were saying. Okay, so I, I want to own some stocks. I, I like stocks a lot. Um, one of the sectors that I've been buying stocks for the trust and for myself is in cybersecurity. 
So I think that that probably later this decade, there'll be some sort of mass cyber event. Obviously, I don't want that to happen. I'm not saying that I think that's a good thing. I'm just saying that that I talk to a lot of corporate executives. I talk to a lot of C-level people. Every single company has a cyber chief now. Mm. And every cyber chief has no clue what they're doing. So, so well, it's pretty new still, right? You know, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what they do is they just try to do everything. They're they're they have no idea how to buy protection. Yeah. And so they're just fumbling around with a checkbook. Like, okay, well this will protect this and this will protect this and 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 th- so what that tells me is that I mean, how many industries do you know that are that new? I mean, it's, 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 that is a unique set of circumstances. Like when you, when you look at like a hurricane insurance, it's not new. I mean, you can, you know, you forecast and it's been happening for a long time, but the fact that you could, your, your, your app goes down and your employees are compromised and your business stops. Whoa. I mean, this is like, what would you pay to prevent that? Would you pay 1% of revenue? Yeah. I mean, well, what kind of number is that massive? So these companies are growing revenue at like 50% a year. It's crazy. And they have free cash flow multiples, you know, that are, that are like wild. So you got to own this stuff, right? So yeah. you, see, you see how I'm starting to, I'm starting yeah, to. Yeah, you're, you're now I've got your paid. I, I think that now I, I do your paid for subscription. I love your writing, by the way. I think you're very, very gifted. And I know you've been doing it a long time. I love your writing, but the, the, I didn't, I got it. I think this morning I want to say, but, didn't you? Wasn't it a topic? I just glanced at. It. I didn't have time to go through the whole thing. But was wasn't that cyber? Some companies that you were looking at wasn't that part of the newsletter? So that you- it's past. Yeah, I mean, it's for, like it's the beginning of the newsletter is always about like what I think about what's going on kind of in the world right now. Yeah. And then the the paid stuff is like you know you get into the portfolio, mm. which is kind of what we're talking about. It's like yeah, I, what I what I decided to do was you know it's kind of like your question. It's like well, what do you do with your money? I mean, it's to say to people like, okay, you, you, you want to own, I mean, you don't want to be like all in on yeah. risk right now. Okay. Yeah. But you want to own some stuff. And so you pick out these sectors that you think are going to benefit from something sure. that's going on. And then what you do is, is you, is you pick two or three, like you try to wait for a little pullback and you pick, you know, end up with two or three companies in that sector that you think is going to benefit and then you play that trend out, right? So let's just say it's oil, right? So you think oil 80 bucks is like not reasonable. It should probably be a hundred. So like, all right, let me pick like two or three ways to play that and put that trade on and I own that stuff. And you're not like looking for miracles to happen. You're not like, oh yeah, I'm going to buy this like 10 cent Vancouver stock that's going to change my life. That's not really the, see, see, that's another part of your money, right? Like, right. So, so, so the thing people get wrong is they put the wrong percentages. So the Moonshot Vancouver company should give you the chance to make 10 to one. Yep. So if something's gonna give you the chance to make 10 to one, what portion of your assets should you have exposed to that? Probably no, like three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so like, so, 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 you know, like for example, um, uh, I, I've had like a hundred to one Vancouver stock before, but, Everybody's like, wow, if you did a million bucks in there, you'd have, but it's like, it doesn't work that way. So I used to, what I used to do, I don't really invest that much anymore in this type of stuff at the moment because the market's pretty dead there, as you know, but I would have, I would do 20 grand to any idea that somebody called me with that I, I had a relationship with them. Like it has to be somebody I, like I know them in some way, like yeah. a lawyer or something would call me. Hey, you want to do this 20? Yeah, I'll give you 20 grand. It was always 20 grand. So I didn't like do more or less because I thought something that sounded good. See the, the hundred to one that I had, I thought sounded like a complete stupid idea and ended up being perfect. But yeah. my point is, is that what portion of your money it, well, if it's, if something's got the potential to do something big, then it should be a really small portion of your money. Mm-hmm. Does this make sense? It's like, and so, yeah, totally. and so, and so when you look at where you want to put all your eggs, I mean, you just don't have to have like massive catapulting success with your investment because you can't every, I'm sure you've had one of these. You never think in the beginning, it's going to be the one. Does that make sense? Totally. It's always like by accident that that happens. There's a, it's interesting though, right? Because when you, you know, when you, somebody pitches you a deal 
And if in some way in that conversation you hear a 10 to 1 possibility, the emotion of it will drive the decision rather than the common sense about it. And and something that I want to go back to that you said, you know, which you talked about habits is creating, you know, habits early on in your life and that maybe eliminates some of that emotion and that you're creating those habits. But when I look at and when we think about it, this is I just got this stat recently is that we ha- we uh, buy the data based on attention spans. A goldfish now has more attention span or as much attention span as a human being, which is about three seconds right now is what I'm what the data is showing. Hard to believe. But the point of that is that how do we educate ourselves or how do people you know have the habit of taking the time to educate themselves so that. When they see these deals, they're not going all in or they're doing the research that they need to do to make decisions as opposed to emotionally, you know, scratching checks. You, you follow that thought process? And Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, first of all, people should not be too hard on themselves for being human. Um, I think I think it's kind of like um, uh, it's kind of like uh, I, I, I try to with my friends and with, with people that I'm socially spend time with, uh, I try to be like, I'm, I'm, I'm like super kind of liberal minded in life, life sense where I don't really think a lot of things are a big deal. Right. So like yeah. I see people struggle a lot with like, sh- I call it should behavior. Like yeah. I should do this or I should not do this and whatever. And I'm, and I always try to like say to them, like try not to be so hard on yourself because it, it, it's you're human. So you get inevitably you're going to get overexcited or over pessimistic and you can't totally breed that out of your life. And so mm-hmm. um, I think what you want to go for is you want to be, go with the flow of your life experience. Like it's inevitable. You're going to go too heavy or too light, or you're going to have some, some thing happen that wasn't what you thought was going to happen. And you're, you're going to say, God, it's so awful. Can't believe it. Well, it's not really that awful. You just, it's just now part of your resume. And so, um, and so I think when you do it long enough, you, you, you realize that it's your, it's your habits that shape where you end up. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I do is like, I have all these, I have all these pads around, you know, like these Japanese pads and, and, you know, have all these things all over the place. And, And I'm always like writing down, I'm always like, um, I, I change it. I change it over time. It's not like, but I have all these things that I'll set the course for myself. And, and I call it uh, like, if you ever baked a cake out of a box, it says like, you know, one egg and yeah, yeah. half a cup of flour. And it's like, you just do what that says and you get a cake. Right. Yeah. So, so, so I'm always like setting up a, um, like a, a certain thing I'm going to do. Like, like one of the things I'm doing right now is like, I'm riding my bike for 30 minutes every day and I'm like riding it to downtown to like do things or whatever. And a part of the reason why I'm doing that is because like I play tennis and I haven't been doing any cardio and I'm like winded on the tennis court, you know, and I'm like, oh, am I, am I dying out here? And so, <laughs> and so anyway, so my point is I, I write down like my routine. Right. And then I, then I do the routine and then I play tennis and I'm like, good to go. So So with your life, it's like, it's like people have got to take the time to say, like, they got to come up with a little, a little, a little Duncan Hines cake recipe, and then you can change it over time. You you don't just like leave it that way forever. I mean, you can get a bigger cake recipe, right? Or whatever you get a different, you can make a pie sometime, but like people don't do this. They don't, they don't, they don't take the time to, to do this because they think either only successful people do this or whatever. And it's like, no, you don't get it. You can do this now. And, and your things on your list will grow faster than if you just wing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So when you look at what's going on in the world today, I mean, you do lots of research, you're well read, you see what's going on in the world because you're playing in the markets, you understand gold markets, you, you're, you're doing a lot of things. So when you look at what's happening globally, global macro, central banks, wars, maybe wars, uh, civil unrest, France is melting down, London's a shit show. Like when you look at all of what's happening, EB, how do you maintain some sense of, I don't know, optimism or hope or where are you in that scale of how you see the world these days 
given what seems to be unfolding? Well, my, my friend, uh, I have a friend named Vince that says that, that he got a lot happier when he gave up hope. And uh, <laughs> okay. it's like, it's fun because it's fun to have philosophical, you know, statements and to think about them. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not really hopeful, you know, because I, I, I think that we're flowing down the river of life and we're just, we have this idea that if we could just make it like we saw up there, then it would be better, but it's not true. You know, you're, you're, you're always, it's constantly changing. And what's happening now is uh, people have become extremely disconnected from reality and the reason they've become disconnected from reality is because they've accepted a life that's easy and and what's happened is reality is being shaped for them and so they have willingly stepped into this uh kind of situation where they're upset all the time they're anxious they're worried they're fearful they're um uh a lot of times their health is not great by yeah. their own choosing and, and um, they can't remember what they were upset about a week ago, but you know, whatever's happening now is this big thing. And so what you see is that this, this, the media accounts of what's happening are not really accurate. And so yeah. one of the things that I do is, is I have no television. I've had no television and I don't, I don't, a lot of people say, Oh, I don't have cable, but it's like, I don't have a television, right? So, I mean, when my kids, I have two kids, they come on the weekend and people, what do you do with them? Well, we play, uh, you know, rum and cube. If you ever play that, it's one of my favorite games. We, we play a lot of games. We, we play tennis. We, we swim in the pool, we listen to music. We, we, you know, we, we go on, I have a classic car. We drive around in all this. We do all this stuff, you know? And the reason why we do that is because um, I want to connect them with, uh, life as a human as much as possible because what we've done when we accept this like manufactured reality is we get rid of our ability to make any sort of discerning decision about anything okay and there's no way you can be successful if you're being whipped around you know by some sort of external force and so the more you back up and and calmly look at things the more obvious it seems you know, you're, you're in this scenario right now in the U.S. where where all the things you're being told are fake. Like, for example, uh, Putin is a bad person who has to be stopped and is doing all these. Ter OK, great. Now. But wait a minute. But but a Swiss energy company last weekend, Swiss. OK, not U.S. Swiss was was taking oil or oil related product from a ship that came from Russia transferred it in the international water and then was protected by the U.S. military from the Houthis. You see how, what I'm saying? So you start realizing the U.S. is under a lot of pressure. Mm. Like it's under a lot of pressure right now. Mm. And, and, and it's got its population totally sedated so that it can, you know, but now it's going to maintain its vast power structure around the world. Well, that is like, I mean, make the popcorn because the action part is just about to happen. It's like, you don't want to miss what's coming next. So <laughs> my, my point is, is that um, I think you've got to, with a sober mind, to watch that stuff without some sort of like outcome. You, it doesn't have to be some certain way. You know, like I'm an avid traveler. I travel a, a lot and and I am going to uh, different places now than I used to go to because, in my opinion, the world is cordoning off into zones and I need to stay in my zone. Now, now I'm from the United States and so technically I'm a U.S. citizen, but I, I, I don't care about being a U.S. citizen because you've got to be born somewhere and you can't not be a citizen of somewhere. And this just happens to be where my parents live. That, that's that's the way that I see it. So I'm kind of like agnostic about, I don't have this idea that, you know, if America would change to suit my vision, it would be better or it would be worse. It just is what it is. And mm -hmm. and so I think it's hard over time. The, for the last 30 years, we've been living in this situation where uh, people have, have, have wisely 
coaxed the average person into total delusion. And so now that's gone for a while now. And so now you have the thing about when you're a kid, you think the Wizard of Oz, there's someone behind the curtain. It's not true. There's actually like I've met people names that I'm not going to say because you know who these names are that are very, very powerful people. There's like a a pyramid of power. Right. And so you don't want to be at the top of it because at the top of it, you when there's nobody else to to take from. You turn on each other. And so and so like you can watch what's happening right now and you can say, like, good luck to you, because like you've painted yourself into a corner and now you're going to fight over the corner. I mean, I I don't want to be in that fight. Like, I want to stay out of that fight. I don't want to be I want to survive that fight. Like if you grew up in um, Middle Ages, you know, England or something, right? Like. You, you you just want to stay out of the way if your feudal lord is is fighting to the death over something. You don't yeah. want to be in that. You don't want to be trying to make money off that. You want to be like, you want to live through that fight. That's what you want to do. And so, because you'll live to, to, you'll have another day. I mean, that's, and so right now we're in this spot where like the, the U.S. has got to make some choices between defending its currency uh, de- you know, defending its financial web that it's created around the world, um, you know, defending the parts of the world that it says it's going to control. Like, for ex- I'll give you a, a specific example, like Strait of Malacca, Indian Ocean, like this region right now is like fully tilting Chinese. And and if you think about it, like if you start adding up what moves through there and you then you say, well, look, look at India. I mean, like there's a battle for India, which is isolated. I mean, India is like, completely surrounded now by Chinese influence. And yep. so it's, it's really strange, right? Cause you start looking at all these pieces on the board and, and a lot of people are into like frontier investing, which I, I just, I've never had success with because um, it's extremely difficult to take Western ideas and apply them, you know, to, to markets that are in places that don't have Western structures mm-hmm. around them. Yeah, and so it's very—it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And and so and so, I, this is a time where I'm watching all this happen, and and that's what shapes the mentality of what I'm investing in. You know, and, and so that you, you as a reader, you probably start seeing like that's why I'm see my job as the trustee is not to uh, do something dramatic. It's it's to be able to say if I if I lose on something, to be able to explain myself. So, well, this is what I was thinking, you know, and this is it didn't work out. You know, what I found is that, you know, around television, I have a television, but, it, you know, I, we don't watch anything mainstream. We never watch mainstream news. That's it's almost like it's such a waste of time. I, I can't watch anything mainstream in Canada, particularly. I mean, we pick up what we pick up from the U.S. But I mean, when you look at mainstream media or what was referred to, I guess, these days as legacy media, I mean, they're losing they're nothing compared to the Joe Rogans, the Tuckers, the the different YouTube channels that are out there that are getting millions of views, but are actually coming forward with some real, I think, some good food for thought in terms of what's unfolding in the world. So the, the, the point is around all of this is, I mean, all of these things have been unfolding for a long time for whatever reason and whatever agenda there might be, we don't know. Ultimately, we see the divisiveness of West and East. We see the divisiveness of what's going on in the U.S. You know, Republican, uh, Democrats always been there. You know, liberal, conservative, always been there. It just seems louder, uh, more divisive, more polarized. Um, You know, people are angrier, which would lead to me to believe, and based on what limited psychology I know, is that anger is always driven by fear. And, you know, when you break it down at the heart of it, anger is always driven by fear, fear of loss, fear of something in that regard. So I'm looking at it right now and I step back from it. I do lots of research, you know, probably not unlike you, probably different in the space I play in. But the point is that how do we, you know, what are your, you know, you stay grounded, you, you work at staying grounded, you stay healthy, you work out, you hang out with your family, you stay out of the the fray of all of the media as much as you can. But how are you guiding even your clients, your friends, yourself? Like what's the game that you're playing mentally saying, okay, 
how do I how do I not only survive this but thrive in this? And you know, is that through diversified portfolio, looking for those opportunities? And do you actually do you still hold out optimism for that future, being able to pull that all off? Like there is you're seeing as an opportunity more than you're seeing it as shit's hitting the fan. Yeah, I mean, there, there's like I'm, 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 I'm not an optimistic person, and yet I still like charge. It's people, people have a hard time with that. But yeah. um, I think, I think, I think the thing people miss is that the numbers are going to get bigger. Mm. So, like, I wrote this thing a, a long time ago about how the U.S. debt doubles under every eight-year presidential cycle, and you go back to uh, like Carter and or Ford. And it's, it's true. You know, you just pick eight years and it tends to double every eight years. And so I wrote that during Trump and people got like uh, really upset about Trump. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with the candidate. I mean, you can put a German shepherd in there and it basically, it doubles every eight years. And and so now it's almost doubled. I mean, there it's like 30, 34 trillion or something. And so need another 2 trillion to when it would have doubled. And I'm sure they could pull it off. And the thing is, is that they need the tax base to keep growing too. Yeah. So it's like the, the thing is going up. I mean, I mean, it's, it's just you, going up. We're, I mean, look at Canada, look at the U S I mean, there were beyond, I mean, to your point, whatever trillion the U S is in debt, Canada is in debt, whatever. I think we are over a trillion, which for a country of 38 million is a lot. And when you consider interest rates, the debt servicing portion of that, I mean, the the pundits who are paying attention to that are all suggesting that it's all got to collapse. The debt bubble has got to collapse. It's an, an inevitability. It isn't a case of if, it's a case of when, which also speaks to the potential for U.S. reserve currency going away. Who knows? Again, when? Well, you don't want that to happen. No. The problem no, is, don't. yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is that, like, you, it, it's going to create like um, a whole different set of issues for us to deal. With. I mean, you actually, what you want is for them to be successful in slowly inflating things to the point where people that aren't playing the game, everybody is always in Canada. I'm always like, I, I just see people are like not intellectually honest a lot of times because they're apologizing to each other for like things that aren't offensive, like, you know, you, you like cut you in line or something. They apologize like 50 times, but then, but then, and then they talk about how regular people can't afford food. They'll tell you about all that. And then they'll tell you about how they just really need to get like a, a speculative 10 cent stock to go to $3. They, you know, it's like, what is going on in your brain? You know I mean? You, you like, you want to make a fortune, a wild west fortune dumping stock on the average person, but you care about them finding enough food. <laughs> but also you're upset. You, you apologize for something that didn't happen. It doesn't make it. It's like their brain is scrambled. And so and so one of the things is like, what's so wrong with wanting to be successful? Like I've got this book that's super controversial um, called The Virtue of so uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, I think is the name. And it's all about how like being selfish is intellectually honest, because because most of those people apologizing to you really aren't sorry, they're just passive aggressive or like they have some kind of like bizarre guilt complex. And so when you change your thinking and you're like, no, I actually want to be independently, you know, established and able to do all the stuff I want to do and take care of my family and everything. I actually want that, you know? So I think that helps you open your eyes to say, well, what do I need to do to get that? You know, instead of being super apologetic, because otherwise what happens is you just envy people. It's, that's no good. So so once you shift, you're like, okay, I, I, I know that the, the, the guys in charge here, guys and girls in charge here, they want this thing to get bigger. They just don't want it to get bigger too fast. That's the problem. And so, so what they're doing is you're trying to manage it up and they, and they got it, it, it got too big during COVID, mm -hmm. you know, because people started getting too rich. So they had to like ratchet that back down. And that's why like the Barry Sternlicks of the world are trying to game that part of the system. It's really hard job for the Fed. As you know, in the newsletter this week, I, I put in there one specific thing to watch that I think when it goes to zero, the Fed's done. And and I think the Fed wants to get a certain amount of money out of the system so that 
when they need to accommodate the system, they let the system grind away. Okay. And then it grinds away. Like you spend down your savings, you know, your, your house bills go up, all this stuff goes up and, and they, they kind of like give the economy a haircut. And then if something bad happens, like if, you know, if a super connected company fails or something happens, that's like people are really upset about, like they're actually going to not just make a poster complaining. They're like throw rocks complaining. Then, then they're able to step in with emergency help and to re-engineer. They want that pace of growth. So they want like 2% loss of value of money every year. And then they, and then they, they even better if they can kind of have that eroding away the value of the last injection that they made to get everything growing again. And they also got to keep you hopeful. So they got to keep you hoping that, that you you're going to something real good is going to happen if you just kind of like keep believing. So I think once you see that, then you see how to play it. It makes it a lot easier than, you know, like wandering around looking for the right podcast or something. I mean, a lot of these people that you're mentioning, it's hard to know if they're really saying what they think, or if some of them are, are like a, a, like a, I don't know. I, I think some of these people are like, you don't, you can't quite know what they're telling you. Right. Yeah. So it's you, you, the reason I say that is I want to be really clear about this is that, is that I don't believe in conspiracies. Okay. So, so I think what you do is you got to stop looking for the answer from someone and start looking at the question. Okay. And you got to understand that, that like, I, I've met people that have been at the top, top, top. I've met people that 20 years ago I was writing blog articles about, you know, like this conspiratorial thing. I've met these people now. Okay, so so I've I've gone full circle, and I just think that that people are on a quest for for power, and they have been that way forever and ever. And there's as soon as you you take off your shoe and swat them like a cockroach. Here comes another one. Okay. So, so, so once you see that, you realize that it's okay. It's part of the system. There's always going to be trilateral commission was before world economic forum. And there's always going to be, there's always going to be some group and, and don't even think about like, what would life be like without them? It will be worse because, because there's something about the system that functions with force and resistance and and evidence. Sometimes force is heavier than resistance. And sometimes resistance is heavier than force. And what you, you don't want to change that at all. You just want to be the observer. Okay. And the way you get to that point is you, you, you disconnect yourself, you educate yourself and you stop thinking about things in a static way. And you start thinking that it's complicated and, and it's okay that it's complicated and you're going to do great. If you start seeing it for what it is, you're instead of what you want it to be, you're going to do great. Like you're mm-hmm. going to do so much better than, than other people because they're bamboozled and, and confused. Like their, 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 their head feels fuzzy and yours doesn't because, because you realize that you're not going for perfection. You're not trying to outsmart the whole system. You're just trying to flow down this river of life that is absolutely perfect. And the only way that you're going to get there is to start that journey and be okay being confused. But I promise you'll you'll get you'll get there. I mean, you you'll you'll get there, and and then you'll love it. Now, the bad thing is is that you won't have as many friends because <laughs> That's true. you want you'll 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 slowly start enjoying quiet more than anything. Mm. Instead of keeping your life buzzing with notifications and stimulus all the time, you'll you'll start like really cherishing these times of you know, just where you have a little bit of solitude or friends that you have that don't come to you with like stirred up, you know, disturbed, like you, like um, you have friends that, you know, you, you just want to, you know, they have a hobby in common or something and you don't like, I, like one of the things, one more thing I want to say about this is like, I never understood why um, I would have these rich friends when I was younger and they, they, like, I would look up to them and they would, they would hang out with like their gardener or something. And I, I was just like, what are you doing with that? Well, now I get it. Like one of my favorite people is my pool guy, right? He says all these like really funny, like uh, accidentally 
smart things. <laughs> and and he never bothers me for anything. He's never like, could you give me a stock tip or, you know, like none of that stuff. He's just like making jokes. And, and you start realizing that like, this is the cool thing about life is that, mm-hmm. is that you're not, there's no like destination is that the more you do the process, the more successful you become. And then the more fun you have, and then it feeds on itself and it just gets bigger and better. I love what you're saying there, you know, a lot, EB. I think there's just some really profound stuff in what you just shared. There is a place where my sense of it and within the community that I travel in and the people I listen to and, you know, 40 years of being in business, you know, where we look at where we are today, you know, my observation is there is a lot of people out there that are, it's almost like we're waiting for the the proverbial shoe to drop. Like there's going to be the shoe to drop. There's something that's going to happen. So in the meantime, you're either life is either uh, suspended, you know, like you're afraid to make any decisions and, or you're chasing after possibilities and trying to make sure that you're ready to survive the inevitable shoe dropping. And you're not really being present to your point. You're not being present to just what is happening in, in life and, and seeing the, I guess the the better side of what really is going on in your day to day. You're so busy looking out into the future and or looking for whatever conspiracy might be there and or uh, insight that you might gain. That's because oh, you know, the, the war started. And, you know, it's official. You know, and get ready. There seems to be a lot of that kind of rhetoric, and and I'm not suggesting it's rhetoric. You know, there, I mean, there's always a degree of truth to something. But how do we how do we stay present in our life when we're busy worrying and wondering about when is the inevitable you know tsunami going to hit us and we're going to be wiped out? That that's just it's, my it's kind of- it's a static way of thinking. So like the, the, what 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 you're taught in the West is is that you you think about everything static, mm. and and so like a perfect example of that is the is the way that I mean I grew up in the American South and it's the way that we're we're taught about like salvation and and eternity and all these it's like you, all these words i'm using are all permanent fixed line um uh a to b kind of things okay and what you figure out is that life is is all these topics that we're talking about we we were trained on these big topics to think in a in a static linear fashion and so it's really hard for us to to think in a dynamic fashion Mm-hmm. And a dynamic fashion means what you're thinking is, is that there's multiple variability points and that change in, into multiple outcomes. And it's the equivalent of going from, from checkers to chess and then for going from chess to go. If you've ever played go, it's like a much infinitely more complicated game than chess. And, and so, and so people get really upset about this because they, 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 they get immediately uh, panicked about the idea of, any, but it's not that complicated. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when you used to drive somewhere and, you know, you didn't have all these GPS on your phone or something. I mean, it's like you, you would run into something along the way and change your course and variables change and all these things happen. And so people need to realize that economics is fascinating and markets are fascinating and, and political control of the markets is fascinating because, there are multiple inputs and, and, and I always enjoyed this. I always, I didn't want a problem that was just, you know, A and B, you know, goes to C and that's it, end of the story, right? Because as far as I was concerned, somebody stronger than me would just come take the problem away, right? So, so I was, there's no way I could win at that game. I actually liked things where there's multiple variables because, because that allowed me to have an advantage. Mm. And and instead of being afraid of it, I was thinking, well, it's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, I'm going to obviously lose sometimes. And if I'm controlling the amount of exposure I have to the situation, who cares if I if I if I can bat uh, 600, you know, I'm in the Hall of Fame. So, I mean, I don't need to have bat a thousand. Right. It's not it's not necessary. And so if people can if people can um, maybe just hear me say that and think, as humans, we have this mind is really powerful, right? And we we do nothing to um, direct it. Like we 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 just kind of like wake up and immediately there's like weeds growing in the garden here. It's like it's like if you bought a computer and you put no software, okay, 
and then you send it onto the internet. And it's like, I can't believe it got a virus. Well, yeah, it has no software. I mean, so, so, so something is going to live here, right? So the stuff that you and I are talking about is like what we're trying to share with people is that just start loading software on here. And that comes in the way of, of learning about things and working on your habits and working on your goals and 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 realizing that life is not. I mean, all you got to do is study how your your body works to realize that nothing is static. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing is static. I mean, no. I mean, I mean, the people, the, the doctors that are the smartest will tell you, like, we don't totally understand how everything works. I mean, it's like an internal medicine guy told me that he's like, we, if we're true, if we're honest, we don't really know how the system works. I mean, okay. So, so that, what that means is, is that you're, you're going with the flow. You're not, um, it's not a, a, a fixed, fixed yeah, thing yeah. That, that can't be changed. And so <laughs> it's important for people to understand that, that, that even if you don't understand what we're saying, it's important for you to hear it because this ties in with success 100%. Like the, the more you move towards this, the more successful you become because you, because you see opportunities that you didn't see when you were thinking in a static linear, linear way. has got to equal B thing. You can't see anything. You're walking around like this and you, and you, you don't know where you're going. Brilliant. I love it. Hey, listen, uh, EB, I know that uh, you've given me a ton of your time and I appreciate it. I'm just going to start to wind this all down. And uh, I do a little bit of rapid fire stuff just to have some fun and kind of lighten up the, you know, as we wind things down. So, uh, yep, for some. Yeah, sure. Kind of rapid fire. Okay, cool. Sure. Okay, really simple. Android or iPhone? iPhone. Do you have a. Have you no, no, no phone. No phone would be the best, but <laughs> you have to you have to be at a place where you really don't care about anything. Yeah, so. you really do. You know, yeah. and you can't live with China. You cannot exist in China without a phone. So, you yeah, know, hopefully we don't get there. Do you have a favorite tune, favorite band or your music guy? Fish. What the hell is fish? Fish with a PH. I think it's the greatest improvisational rock band uh, alive today in its original form. And I, I, I highly recommend people try to catch a show because the, the four guys are, uh, what it is is like, basically you have these super talented, like Juilliard level guys and they, and they start the song and then they kick into like a free form jam. And they're, you gotta see what happens to the, to the crowd. Uh, I, I probably saw them six times last year. And, Love um, it. Wow, I'm gonna they check go, it they, 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 they go to the West Coast. They, they don't go to, they go to Toronto occasionally, but not really to Canada. Yeah. Uh, but you can, you can, they're going to, you know where they're going to play is, uh, have you seen that new thing they have in Vegas with the, oh, the yeah, ceiling yeah. is a screen, you know, they're going to play in the sphere. They're going to play in that, ah. uh, in April, but check out, oh. check out fish. I will definitely check out fish. Yeah. Favorite movie? Big Lebowski. Oh, that's okay. Good one. Your your room, your desk, or your car. What do you clean first? You don't clean anything. You I don't clean anything. You have no. people. I get it. I, I I have a I have this guy called Figgy that cleans the. I have three cars here. Figgy comes over, and I never clean anything with the car. And uh, and then I have a lady that cleans the office. It's it's not because I'm too good for it. I. What it is, is that, like I was telling you about the pool guy, I end up, I have really good luck with people in my life with services, and I end up with long-term yeah, yeah. people, like like the lady that cleans the office, it's been 15 years or something. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to tell you something, I would let her do whatever, if I come back and something's moved, I don't even yeah. It's like it's like she has carte blanche to just like <laughs> she can leave with something, and I I'd say she must have needed it. You see what I mean? Yeah, I totally get. So it. I kind of like I kind of like a little. I have a little. There's a little EB ecosystem, yeah. and um and and it's really the most enjoyable thing. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much fun it is to have happy people around helping <laughs> you for long like decades. Uh, it's fantastic. I totally totally get it. The uh, book that had the most impact on you or one of the books oh, that had the most impact? That's an easy one. Fountainhead. Fountainhead. Yeah. That's never been. I mean, listen, I've done a yeah. few hundred shows and nobody's yeah. ever said to me, Fountainhead. I, I used to give it away. I stopped giving it away. I used to, to keep a big case of the book 
and give it away. And I found that when you give a people a book, they don't read it. You know, so, mm-hmm. so, so Fountainhead, if you are watching this or listening and you are at a place where like you got to, I want you to picture EB Tucker waking up at 4.30 in the morning with a cup of coffee and reading Fountainhead so that he wouldn't be interrupted. This was this was me back in way back in the day. Like mm. that book shaped it's 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 a it's a fiction book, okay? It's it, and what it is is that the the author is is telling you a story to illustrate very important philosophy. And you don't know it, but it's like sugar the pill, right? So so what I found was I I, I that book came to me at a at a time when I when I was ready to take that philosophy and it and it absolutely changed the whole course of my of my work and personal life. Wow. Very powerful. Very, very cool. I will definitely be looking that one up. If uh, heaven exists, what's God? What do you want to hear from God when you hit the gates? Oh, man, I don't I don't I, I guess what's for dinner. I what's mean, for- <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And my final question, EB, what are you grateful for? I, for, I got to tell you for kids, but not for the reason you think. It's it's the um, a, a guy told me I should have a kid and he was like, you, you don't want to miss this experience. And he knew me really well. And uh, and the your perspective changes completely. So mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with like my kids or. I don't even think my kids are that special. Like all the time I tell them we have like intellectual sparring. And I said, I could just make another set of you that's just as good. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because they'll, they like, you know, you, I think you got to spar with them like that. You know, it's yeah, just yeah. Not, they're, I don't coddle them, but <laughs> what it is is that I've, I'm learning how to, to, to appreciate the sensitive parts of myself through my relationship with the kids. I'm always grateful to uh, have a a guest on my show and meet somebody new and have some time to have a conversation with them and grateful for my family, my wife, my amazing wife and uh, all that I do. And really grateful to be able to produce a show like this and attract great guests. So EB, I want to say thanks again. I hope we can do this again sometime. We never even scratched the freaking surface about what I wanted to get into around your book and, you know, some of your royalty stuff. Ooh, I mean, part two, part two, yeah, you got to have an yeah. EB part two. Yeah. Thanks again for your time. Very, very appreciated. Thanks for having me.